How are you? Doing great. All right. Would you remind me what it is you emailed me about? Of course. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, electoralism and uh, in the hopes of maybe swaying your position on electoralism as uh, adequate means for fighting fascism in America. And uh, if we can get to it, I'd also like to talk about uh, your take on sex work. Sure. Well, I can cut you off right here at the front. I don't think it's an adequate means to fight fascism on its own. I think it's a necessary prerequisite for delaying fascist takeover, though. Um, I would have to also disagree with that. I think that, um, so my position is that um, liberals are very, very useful to the anti-fascist movement. And in fact, I think that that's the best thing that liberals can do is resist fascism. But I also think that um, the DNC, at least on the national level, is extremely bad at fighting fascism. And I don't think that that's like an issue with the DNC that can be fixed. And um, I'll explain why, but uh, I'd like to hear your position. Well, I don't think they're particularly good at it. It's just absolutely necessary that a fascist not win the presidential election or ideally any election. I don't, it, it's, it's not a matter of uh, promoting the DNC as an effective Antifa organization or anything like that. It's just, um, you know, it, them winning is significantly better than Republicans winning. So even through their incompetence, they have to. So um, may I ask then what would be a good way of resisting fascism alongside uh, the DNC? Well, a lot of it is just changing people's opinions on the issues. You know, the less susceptible people are to fascist rhetoric, the less powerful fascists are. Um, they can't really do their big coup without a lot of public support. So anything done to sway public opinion, anything done to promote that side of the culture war, that's good. And outside of like that, outside of just changing people's minds, you know, there's local organizing to do stuff like redistricting so you can undo gerrymandering to make it harder for Republicans to win, even in areas where they have the exact same number of supporters, because so many of these states are so heavily gerrymandered in their favor. You can do those mm -hmm. sorts of things. Um, there are active uh, efforts like protesting or counter-protesting that can be done, though they have to be done responsibly, uh, agitation at a local level. And then there's stuff adjacent to this that also has to be tackled, you know, like anti-policing efforts, for example, or supporting homeless issues, which tie into a broader range of anti-fascist advocacy. Um, I see that's kind of where my main disagreement lies, because I feel that... Um, anti-fascism as a cause of uh, shifting the culture towards um, anti-fascism, shifting the culture towards progressivism is hindered by the support of the DNC because uh, activists and um, anti-fascists, when they activate communities into voting for the DNC, into um, supporting the DNC, they also simultaneously get people who would otherwise be distrustful of the electoral system to not uh, use their distrust and and uh, motivate that towards, say, a workers' movement or, say, a, a more effective form of anti-fascism. I agree that protesting is very important, but more protests and more activism and more local community organizing can be accomplished if you don't get people to trust the electoral system. I guess my main issue is um, but this then, push to try to get a bunch of people to vote, but then especially the in flyover win. states. The, the fascists will win anyway, because if you vote for the DNC, it's just delaying the process of fascism. Yeah, but and if you don't, then you don't delay it, and it just happens. That Well, if you promote voting for the DNC, that's energy you could otherwise spend in this culture war that you described. Well, I, don't, I really don't think it's that much of a trade-off. I mean, voting for the Democrats once every two years really doesn't take much of my time or energy. And the people I'm arguing with to vote for the Democrats, like it's mostly leftists who are really just trying to petulantly assert their non-liberal identity. I, I don't think it really takes that much from them. I don't think it takes away from these efforts. Teach people to distrust the system all you like. They still got to vote for the blue. I think that those two things are juxtaposed to each other, really. And I think that um, there's nothing wrong with voting. If you if somebody already votes, there's. I don't think I think it'd be counterproductive to try to get that person to stop voting, but to use our efforts to try to get people to vote, to vote. Sorry, um, it 
would be spending our energy because you're right spending our energy you know voting once every two years or voting in uh, local referendum efforts whatever that doesn't take any energy on an individual level but you look at it from like an organizational level those organizations are spending great amounts of energy trying to get people to vote where otherwise they could be building communal um uh ties and they could be making communities uh intertwined with each other and building coalitions yeah, but, and right, organizing but, protests. But what is what does any of that mean though? Like well, like we're we're talking about like a broad effort here. Protest what? Like you do you think the Republicans will listen to your protests if they win? The only people who are going to listen to protests to change anything will be Democrats because Democrats are at least nominally democratic. Like the the problem is is that everything you're talking about right now is nice and it only works in a liberal democracy in a fascist system they just kill you you know they won't you know you won't get any media attention because they just won't let the press print your issues they won't let favorable coverage be broadcast on daytime television they'll just come in and beat you and lie about why they did it um you know I, the, this is this is what i mean about like the presupposition so many people including you in this seem to believe that like the, the ability to organize is this fundamental thing that will continue to exist even if the Republicans win. And it won't. We have to, that before everything else, that has to be the case. And then we get the luxury of doing, you know, whatever we can to organize outside the DNC. I genuinely think, well, I'm more speaking on leftist groups. So liberal groups, I think that them going and spending their time organizing people to vote and getting people to vote, they were going to do that anyway. You're not going to convince a liberal group to stop doing that. But when well, it comes to better. leftist groups, but well, we don't need to do better. Well, we need to win. We certainly need to win. That's that's of course the case. But I don't think that we're going to be falling to fascism if leftist groups, and I mean like the DSA, just any kind of group to the left of Democrats, any kind of group that isn't liberal, those groups not supporting and organizing to get people to vote, we aren't going to be losing the democracy, the liberal democracy in America, if those organize, uh, organizations don't try to go out and get people to vote. Why not? There are, why, why not just every vote counts, you know? Put your best effort in. You can wear two hats. You can wear your voting hat and your revolutionary hat. When you're wearing your voting hat, you can do A, and when you're doing your revolutionary bit, you can do B. Well, I think that there's a juxtaposition between those things. First of all, I think rev revolution is inherently anti-electoral. And then also, I think that you, you, I think you keep framing uh, getting people to vote through the lens of the voter, because to the voter, you just go out, you get in your car, you go and you, you go to the polls and you vote. But to the organizations that are getting people to vote, there's enormous amounts of money and time and energy that's being dumped into getting people who are disaffected with the electoral system to vote for Democrats mm -hmm. or just vote. See. I, I live in Arkansas, and 50% of the state doesn't vote. And we elected our governor with 33%, or, or 32%, actually. It was yeah. less than a third. Leftists and... need to do more. Liberals are terrible at reaching out to the apathetic and disenfranchised. Leftists could do a much better job. All of those people who didn't vote, they're idiots. They're fools. They should have voted. Everyone should vote. So by reaching out to them with the class analysis we're capable of, that liberals aren't, you know, I, I think we could do uh, a lot of good, potentially, shore up victories in that state and nationally. Yes, but um, the people that are disaffected with the system could otherwise be organizing uh, communal self-sufficiency. They could be feeding each other communally so that they don't have to rely on the capitalist system. They no. could be, this is, this they could is be a... organizing strikes. They could be organizing a wide variety of things well, first but to of all, get them to vote right so the republicans will make strikes illegal so got to keep that safe and no no communal feeding they're going to get their food from a grocery store like americans should why no communal feeding it's not real it's fake <laughs> I, I don't think so i don't think the black panthers would necessarily agree with that black panthers would agree with me they got their food from a grocery store black panthers in chicago and oakland you think they had the farming space and pastures necessary to feed their order in the city? No. They bought their food from a grocery store. Local self-sufficiency is great when it's organized at like a civic level, 
because on a civic level, you know, you can commit to it. You can you can really build out and use those resources. On a local level, you know, building backyard gardens doesn't do anything but make you feel good when you pick the tomatoes. It doesn't it doesn't change anything. I think I think if anything, it's a rather liberal attitude towards change. The idea that change is this um, lifestyle choice that you can you know that there's like a, like 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 recycling or going vegan. Uh, we could be encouraging people to do this, that, the other. But ultimately, it all falls under the same system, right? I mean, what about organizing huge expropriations of what? Of land, of things that could feed people. Expropriate? They'll kill you. Are you going to go up against the government? Well, that's that's far off from now. But you could organize towards that. But when you spend all your energy trying to get people to vote, that's energy that could otherwise be spent in this revolutionary killed? cause of. Well, no, not getting people killed. They wouldn't. Well, of course, people get killed all the time, but not voting. Of course, not yet. <laughs> but um, if you take the energy that is spent trying to get people to vote into trying to get large communities to uh, organize self-sufficiency and democratic self-sufficiency at that, but, you but can. That ain't real. But it can be real. I'm not why, talking about backyard gardens, why, as you put it. Why would a community organize self-sufficiency when it is objectively more efficient for them to just work a minimum wage job and then buy food? Like, the the whole purpose of the modern industrial economy is to reach levels of productive efficiency that exceed anything any individual is capable of. Like, you're going to have people out there toiling, you're going to have black folk in Arkansas toiling out there in the fields to feed their own. But Why? Even at a 725 minimum wage, they could work for eight hours a day, and with less effort, they could buy far more food and tastier food at a grocery store. I mean, what, like, yes, what are you, how are you going to sell them? They would be this? living outside of the system. They don't care. It's, kind of, it's like the old IWW slogan world of the new and the shell of the old, right? So you could build these uh, networks of feeding everybody, and, these, and, and it would be at a they civic level, them. of course. They're grocery I'm not talking stores. About well, the, the grocery stores are owned by capitalists. They don't they're, care. They're capitalists. The, the people who aren't voting aren't like radical and prims. You, you're going to go to a bunch of black people in a poor town in Arkansas and go, hey, are you all ready to work twice as hard so that the food that you get, which is going to be less tasty and nutritionally diverse, comes from a field that we're going to have to steal from the, the city because there's no just free land that you can take? Like, this is this is exactly what I mean, you know? It sounds good, community farming these anarchist diversions from real work in reality if that's the fight you're fighting we've already lost you might as well walk into a river right now it's done there is no existing outside the system the world's been conquered every bit of it the only thing that we can do now is work within it and use it and exploit it as effectively as possible but escaping it won't make you anything but easy prey for people with the will to seize the actual means of control I just think that that's simply untrue because you, you look at the revolutions in South America, you look at the revolutions all across the world. The first step they had to do was organize communal self-sufficiency so that they could uh, go on a general strike. A general strike is impossible in America right now because of the culture that we're at. But if the culture were to shift left, if the population were to shift left and, and have this um, radical mindset of abolishing uh, capitalism and being able to reclaim our lives, uh, the general strike that everybody, everyone would be striving for would be impossible without communal self-sufficiency. And if a Republican's the president? I, well, and if a Democrat is president. No. It would be perceived as impossible if a Democrat's president. It would be perceived as impossible if a Republican's president. They would crack down on us equally. That you think the, the Democrats would honestly true. just go for a general strike? I, I think, you think that Biden would if, go for a general strike? I think if a general strike happened, the response from the Democrats and Republicans would be extremely different. I, I don't think they would be that different at all. I think they the both Republicans have would kill you. Obvious, though. No, 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 no. This is this is a simplistic analysis. They're fascists. Liberal Democrats and fascists respond to worker organizing very, very differently. The most you get from liberal Democrats, for the most part, especially in the modern era, is like Justin Trudeau tier, like emergency powers to stop the strike. Bad, sure, but what do you think the Nazis did? Justin Trudeau's response was not to a general strike, though. Do keep in mind, like a general strike would be a general strike. If, That's an overturning of the system. If you really believe that the Republicans would not be more militant 
in their response. I mean, spe to, like to speak of, we don't even have like the 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 resources for a general strike. People don't want a general strike. Can you tell me of a of a industrialized country that has undergone a revolution which rooted itself in uh, regional uh, self sufficiency? Well, I don't think there's ever been a, a successful revolution. We still live under capitalism now. Yeah, but why would you're telling people to go? to self-sufficiency when it's objectively worse for them? Well, it's not objectively worse during the strike. No, well, it's Because money becomes useless during the strike. There's no way to feed lot. First of all, money doesn't necessarily not exist during a general strike, but also there's no way to feed Los Angeles self-sufficiently. You know that, right? Well, it would start off at a community level. A commu like a big community of people would get together and start feeding each other, and then it would expand to you don't, you don't bigger populations, feed, you don't and it would be a network. Each other. Los Angeles County has over ten million people. There's no farmland in Los Angeles. There's no the the See, resources. That, that's what I was getting to, though. So other people in Cal California is a very rich state with regards to to natural resources. So the people who farm in other parts of California could be able to export those. Uh, that food to Los Angeles. What do you think they farm? And also, why would they do that? Uh, why would they do that? For the general strike. Who, why so would that they Los care? Angeles can be free. Why would they care? Also, how are they free? After a general strike, people would be free, no? No, no not necessarily. They would starve to death. Most of our consumption in this country comes from imports and exports. The global system of trade would break there is no way to use self-sufficient so what you're describing has never been done because it doesn't work there's no way to do self-sufficiency anymore you could do it in countries where they're so dirt poor that they don't have complex system of international trade to support their massive dense populations but all you would get right now is starvation you're never going to get this at a local level people are willing to unionize and strike sure but hey, let's literally end society as we know it in LA and have everyone go out and like become agrarian. Like, you can't just start a farm. You know that, right? First of all, most of the land outside of LA is a desert. It's not usable for anything. The land that can be used for farms further up north, sure, you have like oranges and shit, but a lot of them are like almonds and, and grapes for wine. Not the pastures you'd need to get all the food and chicken and the wheat and, and even then transporting. And, 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 and these are owned by corporations too of course that's why expropriations are necessary and also kill the networks would expand to national level yes they would they would kill people but that's part of revolution now but but you're you're fighting for nothing so are you saying that no revolution would be successful or like how, how are you proposing that we would no, overturn a system version of a revolution just is not feasible in the modern world it's entirely rooted in like an idealized like 101 textbook understanding of how a proletarian revolution happens always in pre-industrial countries it right now if anything in to that effect would happen here which no one would do because you would be giving asking people to give up everything no one's going to trade their cozy life under capitalism for what you're describing if you want like revolutionary action in this system it has to be targeted along class lines it has to be the use of the state apparatus as a modes of seizure you have to quickly and decisively take power and then use it to suppress the people who would try to do a counter revolution the bourgeoisie but that wouldn't be a general strike a general strike would at most just be a disruptive exercise that would allow the proletarian party to take power and then very quickly consolidate it but it could never build through self-sufficiency a week of general strike would kill like 10 million people in this country if it's organized effectively i don't think that's the case and also um i'd like to say that if you seize state power you aren't going to be creating the types of people that can produce reproduce and sustain a decentralized uh industrialized economy like the one that we would advocate for as socialists as as leftists yeah you're not you're not getting that so are, are you advocating for some kind of transitionary phase? Yeah, I'm, from... I'm, I think market socialism is the necessary step. You need to shift the economy and the government over to proletarian control. And after you've done that, you have the luxury of dealing with the um, economic particulars. So how, how do you uh, intend on shifting the state apparatus, the state, with, with its monopoly on violence towards proletarian control? Well, you would do it simply by eliminating the bourgeoisie. 
Um, well, how would you do that? Well, you would do it, ideally, by placing enormous pressure on both the public social apparatus and on a political party favorable to your interests. You would advocate slowly and surely for stuff like higher taxes, government minimums on workplace democracy. You would advocate for wealth taxes and uh, inheritance taxes, and you would slowly bleed away their ridiculously disproportionate wealth. And then, if you had the power to do so, eventually, you would consolidate it. You could do it through a general strike. You could do it through taking advantage of a national crisis. God knows we're going to have plenty of that. The climate crisis really starts broiling up. Um, and then all it would take, once you really have power, is a couple of select laws to legislate the bourgeoisie out of existence. Um, you know, maybe I don't think that's the... possible. You can't, you can't legislate revolution. It's, it's, revolution is fundamentally illegal. There's no social revolution that can be legalized. You can use the government to impose a victorious class warfare if you want. You literally, the bourgeoisie literally can be legislated out of existence. Their existence is a legal farce. They're, the only reason the bourgeoisie exists is because our laws are structured to allow a man who does not work in a factory to own that factory. Private property is a legal construct that can be deconstructed if necessary. The legal system was built upon like not disenfranchising the bourgeoisie and we will change it yeah doesn't it doesn't you you can you can't like it's not as though you can't literally make laws that change that right i mean sure it was built that way but i mean initially the legal code or like you know you could go to the magna carta and the magna carta was constructed to provide you know like rules on on hereditary governance and you know that's that went forward into British common law, and then that was used in the formation of American law. But like, we're not defending monarchies today. We can make this system. We can, we can, we can legislate the bourgeoisie out of existence. I, I think that it's unreasonable. But my main critique of that framework and that ideology is that um, centralized power cannot uh, beget the certain kinds of people, the certain kind of population that can produce and sustain uh, a proletarian society. I think that in order to have a direct democracy or an, an industrialized, um, syndicalized society, what, whatever we want to call it, a liberated society, that can't be achieved by trusting the state to guide us towards that. I agree. I'm not a Marxist-Leninist. Make it a democratic society. Have people vote, you know? Well, vote for what? Well, for which proletarian leader they would prefer. See, that's, that's still an issue, though, because if you are voting for leaders, then you are still dependent upon a hierarchical social system. Yeah, we're in not order getting to out of that. Well, that, that is the, the end goal. No, it's right? not. We're never getting out of that. So you're saying that, that a communal society, a liberated society, is not the end goal? Oh, no, sure. Communal, liberated, but still obviously bureaucratic and hierarchical. We can't not have bureaucracy. I think those things are, are, are very, very juxtaposed to each other. They're very uh, mutually exclusive. There's an agitation. The dialectic continues, certainly. But yeah, I'm I'm all for civil society. I'm all for um, the creation and maintenance of a bureaucracy. I, I, it's the only way to allow people to enjoy a high quality of life. You know, if you want people to get their bodies checked in MRI machines, I, I mean, if you uh, if you if you want people to get their penicillin. We can't give up on this. There's just no way to manage a modern economy uh, without a bureaucracy. Well, how do you um, reconcile the belief that a, a, an industrialized, liberated society cannot exist without bureaucracy with historical examples such as the CNT FAI that was very, very anti-bureaucratic and very uh, decentralized and very directly democratic, but also very industrial? Well, did they have MRI machines? Um, I, I'm not familiar. What, what is an MRI machine? Uh, mag magnetic resonance imaging, I think. They didn't. It was, it was being facetious. MRI machines didn't exist back then. Um, the, uh, uh, so the Iberian Anarchist Federation, look, I'm sympathetic to their aims here, but a militant group of anarchists are not a whole goddamn society. You know, no, when, of course not. When, you, when you're uh, part it, of a militia, you're willing to accept a lower standard of living. And also... The anarchists benefited from the bureaucracy of the uh, systems that they used to sustain themselves. Where do they house themselves in? Democratic, communally, no engineer certification required housing? No, of course not. 
Those buildings were built by engineers that were approved by the Spanish state. Where'd they get their food from? Did they go out and farm all of it? Well, some of it. But a lot of that, they just got through the normal methods of food acquisition that people at the time had access to. Some stuff works well for, you know, just completely, like, decentralized organization. You know, Rojava, for example. But if you want those goddamn MRI machines, you need a massive system of, of trade and certification and technocratic expertise, don't you? You do, and I think that all of that can be decentralized outside of a bureaucratic system. I don't think any of those things beget a bureaucracy. I think that uh, you can have an extremely industrialized society under a directly democratic system. How can you have a technocracy without a bureaucracy? I, I mean, how, how could you get an engineer certified? Um, technological proficiency and, and being, being really educated in a certain field does not necessarily mean the same thing as technocracy to me. No, but least. it should be led by those people. You need um, institutions led by engineers to verify uh, and certify new engineers. And you would need to have them to have the, uh, the ability to um, arrest people who act without their permission. Otherwise, how could you have engineering as a field? Well, you don't need it to be centralized. Those people can still um, do the things that they do in a decentralized system. They don't need to be leaders necessarily. There can be information, like the, the information and uh, information abroad can be shared by other people and it can be distributed to other people. And this information that is correct and objective can be shared by other people in the field in a decentralized system. And who, that who certifies? Who certifies? The, the engineers of, the, of whatever industry there is. But Okay, what happens if there's a person who says that they're an engineer and they show up in a town and they build a building to a substandard level and it collapses? And then it turns out when there's an investigation done that they were certified by a, a group of their own PAL engineers who all certified each other. Did they build this uh, building by themselves? Yeah, well, they, they, I mean, they supervised the construction. They did the plans. So the people that were building the building, knowing, like, they, they built this building that you know these people that build buildings for what they do for work they built it while they probably knew it was not it was going to collapse also well good luck proving is, that would this realistically happen this has this happened this literally happens yes but it's not a profit incentive well yeah well what they yeah people just do whatever right i mean they would have directed construction crews you know maybe the construction crews had some reservations but construction workers aren't engineers so they're not really qualified to determine whether or not a load-bearing pillar is bearing enough load. So how, how would you like manage this? Because we have a good system that works right now. We just allow people to be certified as engineers. And if they're certified, they're responsible for the consequences of their construction. And if they're not certified and they lie about their certification, we shoot them in the back of the head. <laughs> well, um... I, I am sure, I, I still am not sold on the belief that um, information that is correct needs to be approved by a central committee uh, of people with power in order for that information to be shared by everyone. Why not a, is there they, a central committee today that approves what math is correct? Um, in terms of what math is taught? Yes, absolutely. But what math is correct? Is there a centralized group of people that say this formula is incorrect and it is inadequate at um, reaching the desired solution. Is there a central committee of people that decide that right well, now today? There are multiple per country, but yeah, no, the, there, are, there are bureaus of scientific and mathematics standards that, I mean, if you're talking about like really abstract theoretical stuff, like there can be a bit more variance because that tends to trend towards the academic, not really the practical. But the problem is like all of your equations aren't shit till somebody builds something worth three billion dollars using those equations, you know? Like, like no one's going to construct anything based on those calculations unless we're dealing with the certification of an organization, not just one person's say so. And you want centralization too for stuff like uh, medical practice, right? Like, there are so many things that can go wrong with the human body. No doctor knows every solution to every problem. It's, it's not possible. But 
we do have a standard medical practice where if a person is exhibiting certain symptoms, there's kind of like a playbook that doctors are encouraged to follow. And once they know what's going on, they can exercise a little bit more discretion. But that can only work with a sort of central system distributing the information. Otherwise, people are just kind of winging it, you know? Um, I see where you're coming from. But at the same time, I think that, um, especially with regards to the, the medical system, I think that um, rules and regulations can be imposed through the medical system in a decentralized manner. So that there doesn't need centralization to be able to regulate how um, processes are carried out. If you can't regulate I, it, then how do you punish people who break from those standards? You don't let them in. You but, didn't let them in to begin with. Let them in. But, but so if, if there's a group that can determine whether they get let in or not, you're talking about a central committee. If they have the well, ability to the group that would determine people, them is like everyone in that local area that happens to be part of the medical industry. So, the, so it, that's just like a local committee, except regional. Well, that committee would also, that committee would include all of the doctors in the, like all of the doctors in the area. Well, that, I mean, you're basically talking about like a state licensing board at this point. I mean, depending on what you mean by area, but this, you're talking about a state board where like representatives of the- It's a um, state board. Where's the imposition of violence as, as a method of maintaining supremacy? I don't think that there's a state involved here. Well, you need violence. Well, where is violence involved in barring somebody from being able to become a doctor? Preventing a person from uh, per performing their craft in an area is definitely a kind of violence. But what happens if they lie? What happens if they go in fake certification or, um, or, 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 or just flagrantly break medical practice and start doing quackery on their patients? Um, I, think, uh, I think that, well, I don't necessarily disagree that, that violence is necessary. I, I'll say that. But I think that um, centralized violence is unnecessary. So if somebody were to... Um, go in, pretend to be a doctor, maybe even pass as a doctor and do horrible things to their patients, they wouldn't be punished. Um, first of all, the uh, judicial system, or not the judicial system, but the, the systems by which we eradicate um, harmful behavior would not be uh, penal. They would be, uh, of course, they would be, um, I can't believe I'm blanking on the word here. It's, uh, Reformative? Reformative, yes, yes, sorry. It, they would be reformative systems, and uh, they would reform these, uh, say, say a doctor was a psychopath, and he went in, and he uh, passed the medical board, and then he went and did horrible things to his patients. He would be handled in a decentralized way without the imposition of supreme state authority. And who would decide it? Who would decide? The people in the local area. So what you're describing is just local law. The local uh, police are local. They're done at a county level or a city level. So what you're talking about is like a local board, i.e. like the doctors in the area would say like this breaks with our recommended practice. This constitutes like malicious behavior. And then a local group would take them in for reformation and they would probably have a badge doing it. You're reconstructing like current day society, but less efficient because you're not having a representative board, you're just sort of abstractly gesturing at all participants in a system. Um, I suppose that there could be room to define um, removing that psychopath doctor as violence. But I also think that, um, it, I don't think, I think it's still effective. Well, I, I think our current system is effective. I think the our problem with our system is exploitative and our, authoritarian. Ex exploitation is always going to be a part of our systems, and authoritarianism can be mitigated. I think the main problem with our system right now is that it's not proletarian. It's mainly aligned towards bourgeois interests. Almost everything wrong with the way people engage with each other conduct, it has to do with corporate interests, the imposition of bourgeois ideology on what would otherwise be, um, I think, a fairly functioning system. We have an efficient thing going on right now, you know? The law, international trade. I don't think we should be looking to blow it all up, you know? We're not, 
we're not Russian peasants. We don't we don't live in a shit pit, right? We're not farmers in the middle of nowhere, totally isolated, self sufficient. We're we're standing on the shoulders of giants. I think we should recognize that. We should make the changes we need to, but not break things we don't need to. I think that we can fundamentally restructure the industrialized world in a very decentralized and deeply democratic way. And I think that um, industrialized society can continue to exist under a, a more anarchistic, autonomous um, frameworks of uh, managing society. Well, industrial society re relies on bureaucracy. There's just no way of getting around it. The, the supply lines necessary to make even the simplest household objects require like multiple professionals around the world coordinating stuff in real time and billions of dollars in infrastructural investment. There's no real way to de-bureaucratize it. Bureaucracies exist for a reason, after all. Um, I, well, I think that uh, boards of doctors can be characterized as uh, centralized in that only doctors are able to participate in the decision making of which doctors come in and out. But I don't think that's necessarily bureaucratic, and I think that it can still be effective. It is a bureaucracy. I, I guess it's, you have a system to allow entrance or otherwise. You've, you've appointed doctors into a council that have the power to deny other people the right to practice their craft. Um, though we do get into like the regionalism thing here because what happens if a region is just like fucking crazy and they just all of their local doctors are corrupt or not following standard practice you'd have to have another higher level of doctors and this is how we reconstruct the bureaucracy right i think that you can have a global uh like globalized way of conducting um medical uh workings without having it be centralized well how it would kind of be like popular understanding, no? Like po popular understanding. That's not how science works. I suppose that's true. But like when with regards to uh just the carrying out of the medical profession. So doctors would be educated and they would uh have regulations imposed upon them before they can do their work. Regulations but... by who? Regulations by other doctors, of course. Okay, but it's it's not just other doctors. It's a system of doctors above them. Because it's not like one doctor can just bar another doctor. Like, regulations aren't imposed interpersonally from one human to another. You're talking about forming a board of doctors above that can approve or disapprove medical licenses. Okay. I, I, I suppose I can concede that point, but I don't think that that's a system of bureaucracy. Well, I think, I think what happens the, if you the get a way that we're it? conceptualizing it is is very similar, but I wouldn't characterize what we're talking about as bureaucracy. So I think that bureaucracy implies something that's profoundly anti-democratic, anti-human, and anti-social. No, that's because you're loading it with a bunch of presumptions. A bureaucracy is just a multi-tiered system. It's hierarchical internally, but that's not necessarily wrong. Even in a socialist society, if you have like a group of people performing a task, some people will be in charge of others. You can't literally just have everyone milling about with no organization. That level of bureaucracy exists in every aspect of human society. It's not anti-human. Humans made it. We made it to efficiently direct ourselves, and it works. Humans can make anti-human things. Racism is anti-human, is it not? I would, I, I, unfortunately, I would say tribalism is fundamentally human. I think it's anti-humanist. I think it's harmful to humans. But, uh, but how, it, like, bureaucracy, uh, okay, literally just, like, structured organization. You know, one person leads 10 people, lead 10 people each, right? Um, that's how everything works. There's no way around that. Even the anarchist militias had commanders. Well, anarchist militias would not exist once the decentralized, liberated society had been accomplished, no? Do you, do you really think that anarchism is a society in which no one leads other people? Um, I wouldn't use the word lead, no. I think that um, you can have regulations that are imposed by uh, deeply democratic committees in an anarchist society, but I would not use the word lead. How are they democratic? I think that how, how are the doctor's boards democratic? Yeah. Once you become a doctor, you join the syndicated... Um, 
or sorry, the, the industrialized syndicate of the doctors in that region. And uh, the whatever decisions are made in that syndicate are made democratically with the doctors in that area. Well, so what do you mean? So like majority vote? Yeah, majority vote. Okay. And it would it just be like the five million doctors all around the world vote on everything in every area? Well, that would really depend on what is being voted on. If it's being, it's if it's what to do with the uh, amount of syringes that are held in a hospital. If it is, if it is very specific to the hospital, then the people in the hospital would vote. If it's if it's specific to the uh, medical field abroad, then that decision would be made by all doctors across the world. How are they going to get that done? a highly federalized but deeply democratic system okay but how are they going to get the syringes there what do you mean how are they how are they going to get them there do they like do the vote and then they leave the office and they go and pick up some syringes and bring it to the hospital how do they get it to the hospital like exportations and importations they tell people to go begin an economic process to import those syringes well, no, syndicates would communicate with each other. Well, a syn so a if, syndicate like, is, is a bureaucracy, just so you know. Syndicates aren't a flat, direct democracy. Yes, but they could, syndicates have the capacity to be anarchic or autonomous or decentralized. Okay, but I think that your definition of decentralized isn't the definition of decentralized that anarchists use. What you're talking about would end all life on Earth. Anarchists are about eliminating hierarchy as best as you can, but even within anarchist systems, even in like Rojava, right? They have democratic councils that are representative. I mean, people vote on their leaders. There's nothing wrong with leading. That's not anti-anarchic, you know? Um, I, I fundamentally, well, okay. It depends on what we consider leaders and what we consider leadership. Is, is leadership the elected representative to make this, the decisions on this, this, that, and the other? Or is um, leadership somebody who has good ideas and we take them and then we uh, distribute them and we import them and, and we... The, the former, because the, the former, because the latter would never work ever. No, no gigantic complex system can be sustained by a bunch of equal people. And then when the person has a good idea, they do it. No one would show up for that. No one would do that. That's not real. That's not a system that works. If you have a representative leader, somebody you believe in and who you voted for, and you have systems of accreditation, then yeah, I think you can get something going there and you can build a system that's a hell of a lot more democratic than the one we exist in now. But I think the problem is, and this is probably why you disagreed with my voting take, you've idealized an economic and political system that is impossible to achieve and is so idealistic that I don't even know if it would work with the angels in heaven. And as a product of that, you can now comfortably distance yourself from any of the work that you could actually do to make the world a better place. Like what you're describing right now cannot work. It's just not possible. The world's too complicated. It couldn't even work back hundreds of years ago. Even the distribution systems necessary to deal with agricultural development back in the medieval period required, required, not they did it because they were mean, required bureaucracy in order to manage. We can't just rely on humans with good ideas. I mean, how, how often has that worked? Like, um, on principle, where, where, where good things happen at a social level because everyone was just together and then someone had a good idea. How do you determine who's qualified to take care of that idea? How do you know if they're right when they said that idea? How do you, how do you know anything? You need systems of technocratic bureaucracy, people to approve and check on every level and if people fuck up or lie, then you need them to get taken to a big building with very few windows. Um, it, it, there's no way around this. You know, it's just a matter of improving these systems. Um, I think that, would you, would you characterize what uh, the CNT had and the Zapatistas and the Rajavans, would you characterize any of those as industrialized? Um, the Zapatistas are probably the most industrialized of the three, considering uh, that the Federacion 
was a hundred years ago, and Rojava is in eastern Syria. I mean, I'm pretty sure the Zapatistas manage a, a decent amount of, of, of like industrial development and distribution, yeah. So I, I would say that a lot of what the Zapatistas have is fundamentally very uh, uh, decentralized. And it, it, I guess the main, um, the, the main thing that the Zapatistas do right is that they don't centralize ideology and they don't believe in people, as you mentioned earlier. Because I think that there's something fundamentally anti-socialist or anti-revolutionary about, uh, quote-unquote, believing in people and then voting for that person. And then they impose their ideology or they create their ideology. But they have leaders. It's, they do have leaders, but it's not like they believe in the leaders. They only vote for them because, you know, it's... It's how they function. It's not because that, they believe in them yeah, as people. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you vote for leaders and you have an internal bureaucracy because it's how you function. I don't care whether people like believe. I'm not suggesting that people have like a, a worship of the bureaucracy. It's just the systems that you need. Um I well, I think there there is the implication of having kind of kind of an idolization of leaders when you say you believe in them. Well, would, I mean, they listen to them. Like, the people underneath the leaders of, Rosh of, of Zapatistas would die for them. That's a well, kind of belief. Dying for fellow revolutionaries. Dying because and... they were told to by their leader for the revolutionary cause, yes. But it would be for the revolutionary cause, cause not for the leader. But who are they listening to? Whose order would they go into battle on? The revolutionary cause, whatever that is, or the leader. Well, also, I'm pretty sure that the decision to go into uh, combat is not made by the leaders. That would be made by the people that want to go into combat. They would recognize that going into combat is necessary for what is coming to a head or I, whatever I conflict you, is. you, the Zapatistas, the militia members, are not given individual autonomy when it comes to engaging in arms against the Mexican government. Uh, they are absolutely held higher. That that it cannot. That does not work. Otherwise, they would have gotten into skirmishes and been eliminated a long time ago. It's through collective discipline and following orders that they've been able to exist this long. It takes strategy, and strategy takes leadership. You can't have everybody just individually doing their own strategy. That's not strategy. Okay. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with the... Um, I guess take that uh, leadership is necessary under a militia or under a revolution. Not uh, just or not, not a revolution, but in a militia, uh, leadership is absolutely necessary. Like the the Maclevis obviously had leadership, and I, I I don't think the Zapatistas do. Of course, I I wouldn't be uh, oppose them in this. But when it comes to an ideal society, you wouldn't you wouldn't have leadership. Sure, you would. Things could be you, done. You need that decentralized no you can't if if doctors run a hospital they need nurses to do their work and they need janitors to do their work and such they're not all going to do it like on their own they have to take orders how could how could anything major get done without one person giving orders to another person what if you wanted to ship those uh syringes from one production facility to another and the person in, in the truck is just like no then no, no. the person in the truck would have the autonomy to say no, and then somebody else would or wouldn't step up. That is not acceptable for medical practice. You, we can, we, you cannot have people waiting on their insulin and hearing the, hold on, wait, in our decentralized society, the truck driver had a better idea. We're going to see if we can call and ask a bunch of other truck drivers. It and doesn't work. Since it would be industrialized, there would be other truck drivers, you, you know? You can't... Yeah, so what if they all... Why? Why, why? why would you subject an economy to this level of chaos? Why would anyone even produce those syringes, right? Like, there's no, there's no foreman working the factory. There's just, like, a bunch of people in there playing with their dicks, you know? You need to follow orders. Everyone needs to follow orders. They do in Rojava. They do with the Zapatistas. There would be an understanding of how we carry out actions such as producing syringes and then all the people in the factory would be producing syringes either for some kind of labor credit or so, or just for the fulfillment of doing syringes however it works 
it doesn't. What's in- I I feel like I feel like you're running into a problem, which is that you're you're trying to use magic to fill in a gap. Like all humans for all time have enjoyed some basic level of hierarchy in order to get stuff done. And you're like, okay, well, this global trade network would continue to function entirely autonomously with no leadership or orders. That's just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And frankly, I think it's really disappointing that you would arrive at these conclusions. Historically, leftists have been the best critics of our system, but you can't understand it if these are what you've arrived at. I think your political instincts are good, but I don't know why you're so averse to bureaucracy and to leadership. There's nothing wrong with these things. They're not anti-socialist at all. The, the, the idea that anarchism means like everyone is self-sufficient and everyone is their own master, this is a straw man version of anarchism. This is, the, this is like the, 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 the tribal pygmies that white supremacist capitalists point to and go, oh, you want to live in an anarchist society? Go live with that. Go, go carve your own spears to, to hunt for food, you know? We don't have to settle for that. Well, I think that they're uh, pu- pulling it back a little bit. I think that fundamentally there is undesirable labor that can be um, delegated in a communal sense. So, um, with regards to like, say somebody doesn't want to like do the sewer work in a certain area, the community of people would get together and fundamentally reorganize how uh, the sewer work is done. So, people would take turns and shifts of uh, emptying the sewers and managing the sewers why and it would be undesirable labor so that they could coexist in a community of people that is efficient what if they don't want to then they can go live somewhere else so because nobody wants to clean the sewers what if we're cleaning the sewers requires a degree of expertise that they just don't have like there's technical information they don't have access to so if if an unnecessary uh, job, or, or sorry, if, if a necessary job that's undesirable requires expertise, then there would probably be a labor credit system there to incentivize people to do it. Well, pe- what people? Like, they would need to be people with expertise. People, yeah, people to gain the expertise and then do it. There would be a labor, labor credit system there. But you don't just gain to... expertise. Like, you need professionals. Of course. You, you would go through the education. What edu- by the way, what education? What, what do you mean, what education? Like, there's no government. What education? Depending on how you define the government, there, there is government. Governments it's... are bureaucratic by, by necessity, so I assume there wouldn't be one. You would have a, uh, the community of people, uh, and community can, can mean large, small. It's, it's a very abstract term, and I recognize that. But... Um, the people that have expertise on how to uh, empty sewers, it, it well, first of all, there's not an answer for every anarchist question. So it could, that some expertise might be taught in schools at a very young age, or some expertise would be taught in, um, taught later in life if Why you want there to be pursue schools? it. Why wouldn't there be schools? Because there's no, st- you know that public education is a product of the state, right? It didn't That's just only happen. as it currently exists. Why would they make schools? Because it, it requ- it, like schools are necessary for the propping up of society. You need schools to function as a society, so, so communities need, would get together and you build need them. Leadership. In a, so, no, they no, they wouldn't. You I, see, you you. How much your thinking is magical? Like communities will solve all problems. No, they won't. Have you gone? Have you go? Have you, I, I find your attitude a deeply patronizing one, to be honest with you, because it suggests that the only reason the proletariat haven't just fixed everything by doing stuff themselves is because they're too stupid to realize it's better that way. There are no, reasons... no, I don't, I don't think that's the case, though. Well, but I think the, that's a mischaracterization. The, the the bureaucracies we exist within right now are necessary for modern life. The reason it's difficult to move past this is because these bureaucracies are captured under bourgeois interests but they can't be done away with like this is you you realize there's not really anything for me to argue with here right like i say anything and you're like well the community will do it no they won't no they won't they will die they'll kill themselves 
because they ran out of insulin. They, they won't. They won't do it. People need to be told to do things. You need order and law and discipline in order to get people to do the things that need to be done. And if you build society well enough, they get enough free time in the day to not have to live under the burden of law. There's no escape from this. It's been the case for as long as humans have existed, and it continues to exist to this day. We just need the right laws. People like being told to do things. It's great. Have you ever worked on the, on, on the job and been instructed in a friendly and helpful supervisory way by somebody above you and you genuinely learn something? It happens all the time. Yeah, and I think that that can be accomplished in a decentralized system. I think that people still will have that incentive to work, that drive to work. I think that doesn't go away. I think no. that's always there. You, and also, I, I, I want to... People also have a drive to leadership. You know that, right? The drive to order others around is far stronger in humans than the drive to work. I think that that's a social phenomenon. It's not. It's absolutely not. It's been with humans for all time. For all... Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's not... It can't be a social phenomenon. It can't be... It doesn't mean it's a natural. It, it is in literally all human societies that have ever existed. Leadership. There is no anthropological record of any period of time in which that did not happen. It's always happened. I fundamentally disagree that leadership has always existed. It is did leadership existed. exist in the CNT? Yes, they had leaders. They had syndicates. They had. Li they literally had leaders. W which leaders? Do you w were do they you... militia leaders or were they like industrial leaders on every level? Every, I feel like you haven't read that much about these. There, no system exists without leaders. Syndicates have leaders. Anarchist societies have leaders. Unions have leaders. All of them. They elected them. Oh, they all. No organization in human and all of humanity just has a bunch of people at a flat level and then they just agree to things. It doesn't work that way. I, I want to take a moment to talk about the characterization that I that I patronize the proletariat. And I think that the, the reason why the, the, the working class does not rise up and create the society right now, and I think that's because people are conditioned into believing things. And people are conditioned into wanting to have power. People are conditioned into worshiping power and violence and and all of these social phenomenons. I think that they are social phenomenons. But they've I think always that, existed. They just because they've always existed doesn't mean that they're not social phenomena. Do you, you realize the idea that anarchism means no leaders is like a stereotype? I, I feel like um, I like I feel like I'm talking to somebody defending communism, and they're like, "No, communism requires that 40 million of us starve to death every year. We that's good, and we like it that way. There's there's no historical evidence to suggest that we can ever avoid starvation. Or we should do like I the idea like. The idea of axing leadership when it's omnipresent and beneficial is so strange to me. The term is no gods, no masters, as in slave masters, not no leaders. Right now, as it exists in the world, the leadership and the governments and the states and the, the, the apparatuses of supremacy that manage other people preserve themselves by convincing the uh, base of people that they rule over that they're necessary and by making them dependent on those systems leaders we don't need... are necessary just not those ones so do you think it, the the phenomenon of capitalism and the phenomenon of oppression is simply just a product of bad leadership a bad systems yeah the the leadership we have is a product of those systems it's yeah it's the system the leadership is omnipresent and unavoidable um, but with the right systems, we get the right leaders, or at least we get the right class character of leaders, of course. It's still possible to have bad leadership in any system. I think that's a very, very... Um, I, I, I don't know how I would necessarily characterize it. It's like kind of like a liberal take of, of what um, socialism is and what the socialist critique of capitalism is. I, the problem of the supreme class, the supremacist globalist um, elite, the corporations the problem is not the fact that they are the bad kinds of leaders the problem is that they are centralized in the way that they're centralized yeah and with the right systems they can be decentralized we can get more direct exactly. democracy but we still have leaders we always need leaders it's not a liberal critique liberal critiques are about individuals i'm critiquing systems you're critiquing reality 
you're not even operating on a leftist critique now. You might as well be arguing that should we could simply excise greed from our hearts and be better people. Leadership is a good thing. We need leaders. Some people are educated and some aren't. Some are talented and some aren't. Some people can make decisions and a lot of people can't. Making decisions is tough. Some people are ridden by anxiety and guilt and some people are capable of hardening their heart a little bit. Some people are stupid and some people aren't. You know, you can't... Even if everyone was the same, even if everyone was equally intelligent and capable, if you got a hundred of them together and then said they all had to arrive at a consensus for a conclusion, what do you get? Nothing. Interminable debate, right? Like, even if I, if I cloned a hundred of me and we were all in a room together and we were told, you know, like, here's a topic, what, what, what conclusion are you going to arrive at? We would just argue forever. The, the whole point of leadership is to streamline that process to allow for quick decision making. It allows for representative democracy, where rather than fighting over the individual opinions of a hundred million people, you can instead battle over like a leader, a representative. There are lots of benefits to it. You just need to have the right pool of leaders and the right systems to prop them up. And that's the anarchists knew that. Zapatistas have leaders. Rojava has leaders. They have very rotating leadership. Like they elect leaders on a week to week basis, basically. Sure. It's, I think, I, I just think that that's, I, that's not exactly how I would define a, a, a system of leadership. Well, it is. That's, that's temporary leader. Also, it's not like they all do, right? I mean, I can look here at the leaders of the Zapatistas. Um, Ramona, uh, 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 Rafael Sebastian Guillén Vincente. Uh, Elisa, these people did not serve for weeks. They served respectively for a decent length of time. These are just the people listed like right at the top of the Wikipedia page. I mean, I didn't know their names offhand. Those um, are militia leaders, yes? Well, it's the Zapatistas, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that would be like different because I, I would defend leadership under a militia. But they do this as well for their non-militia efforts. The Zapati the, the Rojavans have represented... Yes, but the leadership, the leadership from other um like for other efforts is is very very rotating like it rotates every week or two weeks it's so it's the, not even what i would consider leadership because all of the decisions that are made are basically made like the the decisions and the uh, positions that are held by people um are brought up from the voter base of people the 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 Community. Sure, this is still and leadership. Then they they're, take they're leadership. Okay. See, well, look, I, the Zapatistas, I guess I disagree with that being a form of leadership. The Zapatistas describe themselves as a decentralized organization. The pseudonymous subcomandante Marcos is widely considered its leader, despite his claims the group has no single leader. I heard that one from Stalin before, you know? Oh, glorious father Stalin. He's like, no, no, I'm but a humble servant. Political decisions are deliberated and decided in community assemblies. Military and organizational matters are decided by the Zapatista area elders who compose the general command, um, or the CCRICG. These are all systems of bureaucracy and leadership. They're much more democratic than the ones we have today, but I feel like, I mean, I'm fine with this, you know? And keep in mind that the Zapatistas are, what, 7,000 people? I mean, this is like a small college, you know? not exactly a country. If you want to talk about Rojava, for which the population is in the millions, they also have, uh, you know, bureaucratic systems. And they're probably the most robust anarchist society to have ever existed, really. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with most of what you said just then. Um, and I think that when it comes to militia and, like, war-torn conflicts i think that leadership is necessary long-term leadership is necessary but it's very important to make sure that the, that kind of leadership is not pervasive of the industries the way that the society functions the way that it was in the soviet union well i agree the, the soviet that... union was deeply autocratic but yeah I mean, the, the rojava isn't just bureaucratic in its militia there are millions of civilians in east syria they're also bureaucratic at every other level trade, distribution, medical and education systems. There's no reason to escape bureaucracy here because it works. Well, I, th I think, I think our, our biggest 
disagreement here is just our definition of bureaucracy, because I wouldn't characterize what the Rajavans have as bureaucratic. I'm only talking about people leading other people. A bureaucracy is just a, a, a contained system of, of, of control, leadership over representative, over representative and such. I'm not talking about one person being elected in like a, you know, like as a glorious uh, leader of all and then being worshipped or anything like that. I'm just talking about... Well, that's, that's, that's honestly sort of what I meant by, um, or, or not what, what I meant, but like what I kind of saw in your characterization of leadership as somebody that you believe in. Because when you believe in someone, that's a form of worshipping them. That's a form of elevating them beyond the uh, standard of equality. The Zapatistas believe in their leaders. The Zapatistas believe in the cause, and they believe the in leaders... their leaders. They believe in their leaders. It's human to revere and trust people who are stationed above you, as long as they're good, or even if they're bad. Sometimes it's a, you're just trusting them. You can trust people above you. Society can't function if you can't. If they trust them so much, why is it rotating leadership every two weeks? Because, well, for one, the, like we said, the one guy has been leader for like over a decade. We talked about, you know, even though he denies leadership, even though it's widely recognized. So, Comandante and Marcos, yeah, I, I, is, yeah, yes. Sorry, I, I got him confused with somebody else. Yeah. Um, so, like, it's not like every two weeks it rotates out. You know, I, I, I described the the system. Um, they have but what he's leading as a militia, yes. But but it's it's okay to trust people. With regards to the militia, yes, because no, it's no, a militia, no, no, no. it's not the functioning of a society. No, it's okay to work at a hospital and trust a head doctor who presides over its affairs. It's okay to trust an accountant who manages your, or an ombudsman who, who, who manages your, your resources. It's okay to trust people. It's okay yeah, to but... trust a coordinator who manages the distribution of grain across, uh, across a city to different like, points of, uh, uh, of, of sub-distribution. That's, that's fine. Yes, but those leaders would have, you know, constant elections for their leadership. They wouldn't just be appointed in uh, a very authoritarian way. It I'm would be like elections. Uh, okay, I'm okay with it being democratic, but also it doesn't all have to be democratic. But those, but those elections would occur like every two weeks, and no. every decision that was made would have to be approved. No, no, a local leader of distribution who just manages like. The distribution of grain within the city does not to be, need to be replaced every two weeks. It takes more than two weeks to train for the job. You can't actually have people switch out in positions every two weeks. Okay, maybe the people that are not switched out every two weeks would have uh, a majority of their decisions approved with a majority vote. No, they're the leader. That they don't. That the point of them being a leader is that they just do it. That's the that other. Otherwise, you don't have a leader. You just have another. You, you just have like a redundant process. I they just they're just in charge. If they're found to be incompetent, then the people beneath them can vote them out. That's how I like it because that way you can allow things to function smoothly. If you've got a hundred workers at a factory and then you have a foreman and a manager and the foreman is beloved by the people beneath him and they're doing good work, then okay. but if the foreman's a cunt, then you know you can you can hold uh, an, a, a, you know like a, an election of no faith. Um, and you can oust them and 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 replace him with one of your own. I think that that strikes a good balance because it means that they're accountable to the people underneath them. But you also, as long as things are running smoothly, you you allow it to 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 operate without um, it constant, you know, uh, reshaping. I think that um, I mean you are aware that the foreman in this example could uh, change the way that he's perceived. While carrying out oppression, that's what the upper class does. That's. I'm sorry, we're not getting around this one. Yeah, that that is democracy. Sometimes people lie. Well, he'll he'll lie about the necessity of his actions. He'll lie about um, why he does things. He'll lie about uh, enough things until the people that vote for him can't recognize his, as you would put it, cunt behavior. Well, if so, if he gaslights a hundred people, honest to God, then he just deserves to gaslight him. He sounds like a king to me. Like all those people, factory workers, those bunch, and then he like tricks all of them. Okay, 
I mean, yeah, yeah. this is always going to be the case. Like, even in a system without leaders, you could have people lying or misrepresenting their fellow doctors in a flat system. Like, what you're describing is an omnipresent human problem. Oh, we don't have a board of doctors. We have, like, just all of them in the region that vote on this. Okay, well, what if one doctor goes doctor to doctor and persuades them and moves them over, and eventually the whole system's corrupt because they've managed to, like, you know, root everyone in their perspective? Sure, that can happen no matter what. I think that democracy not, gives us only... the best chance. It's not only the fact that um, he was able to manipulate people, it's also, and the foreman, and I'm speaking of the foreman, mm -hmm. it's not only the fact that he was able to manipulate people the way that the doctor would in the flat system, it's also the fact that he was able to do it while holding on to power, which fundamentally restructures the conversation we're having, because if he's able to uh, manipulate people in, like, while in power, and he does... Uh, this manipulation with the empowerment of his position, this changes the conversation we're having that entirely. Doesn't. The doctor also has power. In fact, I would argue the doctor actually has more power because in your system, there wouldn't be an overlying regulatory body to deal with that kind of corruption. Whereas in my system, because I accept bureaucracies, there would be a higher power to defer to. If there was um, a foreman who was running his own little cult, all it would take is some of the workers to go appeal to their union or their syndicate or to local regulatory boards, or to the government, and they could go, hey, look at this. And then there could be like other regulatory control. But that also requires a bureaucracy. It can't just be like people on the side, you know? I Checks and balances. That's the goal, right? That's the whole point of democracy and of decentralization. We structure everything to make sure that people have as much control over their workplace or society or whatever as possible. But we can't give up the, the, the fundamentals that make modern society possible. I, uh, I suppose, I, would you like to move on to the sex work conversation? I think that we're kind of running in circles with the leadership conversation. Sure. I have some time, but not a tremendous amount. Okay. Um, I, I greatly appreciate you for having me on, by the way. I'm enjoying Seriously. the conversation. Um, so... I uh, I don't want to mischaracterize uh, your position. So can you repeat your position on sex work? I think it's cool. Okay. So my position is that sex work is uh, exploitative and it is uh, it, it erodes consent. So with regards to sex work in a in a money based system, a market based system. It cannot exist um, alongside consent, because I think that money fundamentally erodes consent. Same thing with labor credits in a, in a market socialist system. So, like for instance, some work some work is absolutely necessary, like um, distributing goods and services. But sex work, it, it's not as necessary. And then further, um, further sex workers are coerced into doing what they're doing with a monetary incentive rather than simply consenting to the action of sleeping with the person who's interested in sleeping with them. Isn't that the case with all work, though? It is the case with all work. It's just that sex work is, for one, unnecessary, and then for two, um, it relies... Uh, it, it, there's a much more deep violation of consent with sex work, well, then... I don't know what you mean by unnecessary. I mean, all work is unnecessary if you're willing to lower the standard of living far enough. I don't think that a society in which sex work does not exist necessarily implies a lower living standard. It so... absolutely does for uh, some people. But like, okay, so restaurants aren't necessary. Restaurants are not necessary, and it can be decided during a giant social revolution whether or not restaurants are should continue to exist, whether or not the position of the servant should exist, or whether or not we should have cafes where people serve themselves. I would fall on the side of saying that restaurants can continue to exist in a deeply democratic system, and I would prefer that. But if the general consensus is that they shouldn't, I think that that's, that is the more important position. That's, that's the position that wins. I don't know what the general consensus is. I don't know what that, like a person-to-person -person poll. Whatever the case is, I don't care whether or not the field is necessary. I don't know what necessary means. 
I don't think that engaging in sex work is any more a violation of a person's bodily autonomy than having to do oil rig work or coal mining or service work or anything of the sort. It's corrosive of consent. That's the issue. Because if so, so, for instance, for porn, um, porn is made um, under a monetary system, of course, obviously. Well, the porn stars are paid to sleep with the person that they're sleeping with, and then the tape of it gets uploaded, so on and so forth. But the issue that's there is that they're not sleeping with that person and having them be filmed while sleeping with them under the consent of just simply wanting to do it, which right. is, that would be fine on its own, but they're doing it for money. They're doing it for uh, the gratification of having money. Well, that's and the that's, case with all work. It, it is the case with all work, yes. Um, but th there's a fundamental distinction here, and it has to do with the fact that... Well, I don't know how. Cons consent. Consent is the fundamental distinction. Well, they're doing their job in either case, a porn star or a coal miner. I mean, what it, it, the consent is being violated to the same extent in both cases. They have to do something for work. They wouldn't do otherwise, so they do it. Yeah, that's kind of the issue. It's it's because even the way that you framed it there is is framing it under a system where it's not even reformed a little bit. So they have to do it for work. Yeah, that's that's, that's an issue. That's what that's, everyone. Every, that's what jobs are. Everyone does them for the money. Being conditioned and coerced into having to do something like sex work is what, so what do, not so okay. What do you mean? What do you mean by something like sex work? What is it about sex work that makes it different from other work? The consent of engaging in human intercourse. That's what's different. What, how is that different than the consent of engaging in serving tables or coal mining or whatever it's different because there first of all there, there's a lot of trauma involved with have not completely consenting to an action of sex and only consenting because of money that's erodes a person's psychology oh, it, i don't i i, I don't th i think this is um highly moralizing plenty of people feel trauma from negative experiences associated with all kinds of work. I don't I don't think it's fair to point out sex work specifically. I don't think there's anything fundamentally different between selling your body for sex and selling your body for coal mining. I keep going back to coal mining because it's a historical job, but you know, farming, whatever else. Um, yes, but being forced or, or coerced by a society into doing either of those things is, is equally wrong. So then and... why specify sex work? Well, it's specifically your position on sex. You, you say that sex work is, is good, cool. It's, it would exist in, in an ideal society. Well, so I don't would farming, think that's the I case. Hope. Yeah. So would farming, but it wouldn't exist under the monetary system of coercion that we currently exist under. Well, in an ideal system, there wouldn't be money anyway, so sex work yes. wouldn't be monetarily incentivized. But Sex work would as... stop becoming sex work, and it would just be actions that we're engaged in. Well, it can still be work, I mean, you know, depending on why it's being done. But... Um, Hopefully in, it would only be done because they consent to it and they well, want to do it. I mean, if there's no monetary incentive, presumably the only reason anyone would do work is because they'd be consenting to it. But in the system we live in currently, where people do work for money, I don't think there's any difference between being a farmer and a sex worker. So if farming is legal, and it is, then why not sex work? Sex work should be legal. Uh, I'm, I'm more making the argument that sex work would not exist in an ideal society. And it is harmful as... Uh, as work it's not good for society well but if if the ideal society is one in which work as we understand it doesn't exist anyway then it seems like we're just treating sex work the same as everything else i suppose that could be the case yes um but we should active actively oppose sex work on its own because of how it also supports systems like the patriarchy well wait, wait but i thought you said sex work should be legal Se sex work should be legal yes but we should make a social um, case against uh, engaging in sex work, the, the boycotting of sex work, the um, fundamental deconstruction of the industry. Um, I think that we should struggle against it specifically because it's an element of patriarchy. It can be intertwined with the struggle with capitalism. Well, okay, so you want it, you want it to be legal, but you also want to protest against it. But why protest against it as opposed to any other existing system that costs money? 
because it contributes to the patriarchy. It contributes to a very specific system of supremacy. I mean, pretty much everything does, right? It's pretty omnipresent. Yes, yes, that, that's absolutely correct. But um, sex work very specifically reinforces and reproduces patriarchal conditions in a way that is very unrivaled by a lot of other actions that we could take on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, then why not just choose to protest every industry and act that you think reaffirms those patriarchal standards? Why specifically sex work? Because there's like a lot of stuff that falls into that. What, uh, what else falls into it? And I would probably agree. I mean, basically anything yeah. associated with the wedding industry, basically anything associated with the modeling industry, basically anything associated with the fashion industry, it would be like, it, it, would, it would end up encompassing like a ridiculous amount of stuff altogether. I think that we should protest all three of those things, as well, well as sex work. Well, then it's not. Then we're not really talking about protesting sex work. We're just talking about boycotting. Now we're circling back to a liberal argument of vote with your wallet. It, it's not just boycotting. It's also directly struggling against it. So, you know, I, there there are things I probably shouldn't say on the stream of like what we could do to you know expropriate. You're not going to car and, bomb a porn studio, are you? Not that I would. Not that I would talk about. Not that I would talk about. Why would you? Wait, hold on. Jo I mean, jokes aside, you know that wouldn't change anything, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm more taught. So the direct struggle against sex work that is intertwined with the struggle with capitalism, which is, you know, all struggles should be intertwined, you know, coalition building, so on and so forth. But I think that we should directly struggle with it and make it part of the um, social change so that we avoid the, the implementation of sex work or the imposition of sex work in a, a socialist society. I mean, if it's a socialist society, then I, presumably there wouldn't be a financial incentive. Uh, but that would be the case with all work. I just don't understand the particular aversion to sex work as it exists right now. There's no way to spend your money or spend your time without in some way supporting the existing superstructure. I don't know how sex work is any meaningfully different. Um, it... Well, it's meaningfully different because of how it contributes to the patriarchy, but you are right in pointing out that it's uh, a lot of the criticism towards it is criticism that could be levied towards other work, but it uniquely affects um, the social problem of patriarchy in a way that isn't shared by, say, working at Walmart. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I guess I don't really know if that's true. I feel like there are lots of jobs you could work where you could potentially be doing a lot more harm to women broadly than producing porn. You know, people hyperfixate on porn, I think, as an element of patriarchal um, production because it's so visible and because it's so ostentatious is bec and because it's deliberately designed to be provocative, of course. But I don't know. I, I don't really know if there's any like meaningful difference here. Another thing, like, worth pointing out, I think, is that, like, the people who champion abolishing porn the loudest are Christian conservatives, who are also the biggest advocates of patriarchy. I've always felt like, you know, progressive arguments for the excision of sex work and pornography have always sounded weirdly similar to those arguments to me, and I feel like they end up reinforcing a lot of those dynamics. Rather than it being about patriarchy, of course, they talk about female purity and chastity, but they end up, like, circling the same drain of moral purity testing, and I, I wonder, like, how progressive it is, even is to go that direction. Well, there's two things that I, I really want to hit on with the criticism you just made, and the, the first one is that I think that uh, the, the biggest distinction between the conservative argument against sex work and the radical feminist argument against sex work is that a conservative emphasizes the inferiority and degeneracy of the women who engage in sex work. There's no degeneracy in, um, in engaging in sex work from the perspective of the sex worker. And there's no moral inferiority if you are a sex worker. You are just being oppressed under a system that coerced you into doing the things that you're doing. I've heard conservatives that, say stuff like that, especially the Christian ones, like, oh, these lost wayward women who have been, like, you know, compelled by modern feminism to do this? Well, generally, it's not modern feminism that compels them. It's the monetary system that coerces them into doing it. So the other thing I was going to point out is that 
it's so, so important to emphasize why sex work is bad and why it should be struggled against in the broader struggle against capitalism, because we should intertwine uh, the struggles of uh, women under the patriarchy, indigenous people, uh, uh, black people, all these groups of people who have their own unique struggles should have their struggles promoted uh, and, and emphasized and um, talked about under the struggle during uh, under uh, the struggle during capitalism. So that's kind of what I'm pointing out here. So if we are to have a successful struggle, one that does not let sex work prevail in a socialist society somehow, some way, then I think that it's very important to emphasize sex work as uh, bad for women and exploitative and having it emphasized as particularly harmful. I, I, I guess I just don't know how much I believe in that. I know a lot of people get into sex work because it's actually preferable to them, to the, um, the, uh, um, like service work they were doing before. I, I agree there are problems with pornography and with sex work, but I really don't like Lambasca as some kind of specific patriarchal evil, not only because of the adjacency to conservative talking points, but also because it's like, um, I just don't think it is. I, I think a lot of stuff negatively affects women and a lot of it, it sort of is channeled through pornography. The problem is though, is that like, Pornography is also in many cases liberatory. Like I know for an absolute fact that there's a very significant portion of pornography production and consumption that fits cleanly into like queer and kink identities that help people, you know, understand themselves or whatever. And that's still porn. And if we talk about saying, well, that's fine, but the other isn't, then we're not talking about banning sex work or boycotting sex work or whatever. We're talking about what should sex work look like? And I have plenty of interesting opinions on that in terms of like what laws could be produced or like what specific things could be regulated or touched on or taxed or whatever. I think there's a lot to work on in, in, in that sense, you know, but I don't think it's because of the innate badness of the industry. I just think that because sexuality is such a touchy, you know, topic in our mind, people are very vulnerable to uh, the impressions they get from it. And so it should be treated with some degree of care. I think that there's something profoundly capitalistic about promoting porn as any kind of liberatory means for LGBTQ people. I recognize that it can feel liberatory as opposed to um, what what other like what the struggle looks like currently, because the struggle for LGBTQ liberation historically has not always been one that was super vitalized. And if people turn to porn to seek liberation, that would be understandable but we'd need to understand that it's not actually liberation isn't it just like reading a book it's just media how is it more capitalistic to look at porn in it is because, as a focal point for like body acceptance or queer positivity than a book because the people that engage in porn do so for the monetary incentive but, well first of all they can do it for the monetary incentive and also because they believe in what they're producing that would also describe me, and it also describes pretty much all authors as well. So myself... Yes, but porn well, stars specifically engage in porn and sex work okay. because they have the monetary incentive. That's also the case with people who write books and live stream. Yeah, but the work that they're doing, not only does the work that they're doing exist under a patriarchal system... All work and does. It, yes, but... Okay, let, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry. Sex work is harmful because the people who engage in sex work are doing so so that they can make money, not because they necessarily consent to it, not necessarily because they would otherwise be sleeping with the person that they're sleeping with or having sex with the person that they're having sex with or doing whatever with the person that they're doing whatever with. It's for money which is why it's bad. It erodes consent. That is it also how produces... media... This is just a job. This is how all media is produced. But sexual consent is is uniquely more important and uh, uniquely should be emphasized over the violation of consent of like See, a this Walmart is what play. I mean. You didn't mention that before, but this is like, this is like a specific weirdness about sex. 
If there are people who want to produce porn and make a buck off doing it, they both get together and they make the porn, or they have a production studio and they make the porn, they produce it, they make some money off of it. I don't think that's any fundamentally different. Like, a, a writer can can spend hours a day writing, can can have their marriage torn apart all the time they put into that book, and it releases, you know? There's always a sacrifice. I could make a bunch of arguments about how the porn industry works and how that that's just fundamentally not how uh, porn stars are recruited and fundamentally well, wait, not how the, the industry star. functions, but... No, I, I agree the porn well, okay. industry is generally very bad and exploitative, but we're talking about the fundamentals here. If there, You said it was capitalistic for queer people to see some degree of liberation in like queer or kink-produced pornography. Say that pornography is produced by people who legitimately enjoyed producing it, like the message they're putting out there, and also don't mind making money off of it. Is that wrong or capitalistic? Because that's the case with like a lot of art and media, you know? I if wouldn't those, do if this people... if it wasn't for the money that I made because I wouldn't be able to because I'd have to be working a job to make the money to afford my rent. I, I the, Making money off of a thing is something all people have to do with the work they do unless they're already so wealthy they don't have to worry about it. If those people would be doing the actions that they're doing outside of the money-based, market-based system that coerced them into the action of the work that they're doing, then yes, it would be acceptable. And yes, that, that is acceptable, but there's no way to distinguish when a porn star is, um, it, it, it would do it otherwise outside of a money-based system. But money That's is kind a consideration of for all of these jobs. It is, but the sex work industry wouldn't exist the way that the food industry would outside of capitalism because co it's built upon coercion. We don't, you, you can't speculate what it would look like outside of that. All labor is built upon coercion in a monetary system. I agree to this. I just don't see what distinguishes sex work. What does they, well, it, when you look at something like the food industry, food needs to be produced and distributed to people in the most effective way possible. But the sex industry, not only is it unnecessary labor, labor people aren't going to die without it. It's well, also labor that relies on the exploitation of people. And it does, further, both cases it does. Food what? workers are exploited. Well, yes, of course. But so then, so see, this is what I mean. Like, what? So what's the difference? The difference is that the food workers are being coerced into doing the work that they're doing, and they get exploit doing exploited doing the work that they're doing. But their work is necessary. Now, I don't care okay. what is or isn't necessary. Okay, if we if we boil that down, then we could say like, oh, well, the only thing you need is grain and like sugar and milk and that's it and all other forms of food production are unnecessary i don't care whether it's necessary or not it's just not relevant to me if two people want to make money because they've got like a big dick and a fat pussy or whatever and they want to make porn and they make the porn and they make the money but they liked making the money and doing the porn or maybe hell to them the porn was just like a job like like a job, sometimes it's fun, and sometimes it's kind of tedious, but altogether, you know, it's a living. If they have that attitude towards their sex work, is that not fine? If they have the attitude of wanting to do it in the first place, regardless of if they were getting paid or no, not, No, no, the specific fine. description that I just gave. They need to make money with their work because we need to pay rent, all of us. So they wanted to make the mm -hmm. money, they have to make money somehow, and they thought, hey, I've got a big dick, why not do it this way? So then they, they, they make the porn. Well, that's not the case for most people who are in the porn industry. But in that most case, people. are you? do you think that's fine? Do you think that's like a, an acceptable, equally acceptable thing? Well, there's no way of eradicating the coercive factors of a money-based system. So, so under that system where everything without is coercive. Abolishing, without abolishing sex work. Or, or okay, so sorry. I'm I'm going to reiterate. The sex workers are doing it for money, and the the work that they engage in is for money. Other, if they just wanted to have sex, they would just have sex, and they would upload it online if they wanted to upload it online. Yeah, people do jobs for money, but people do jobs for money, and that's kind of the issue because if they're coerced into doing the sex work, it suddenly becomes a much bigger issue than wanting to do it in the first place regardless of if you were Same getting paid or not every other job also i don't yes. like the idea okay i mm, i don't like the conflation of consent here terminology wise okay i don't like the idea that like 
a person having to work at Kroger's, even though they don't want to, is the same as a woman being held down and raped. Um, I agree that it, there is an underlying and fundamental violation of consent associated with having to work for a living because you have to do things to survive. I think that could be mitigated even with like a really robust welfare system or, or UBI or whatever. But I don't, I don't like the conflation here necessarily, okay? So there are two kinds of violations of consent that can happen when porn stars are making porn. One of them is the underlying economic violation of consent associated with needing to make money and therefore having to do that work. But you know what? I've had sex before and I've worked a retail job. If I woke up one day broke, realized I had to make rent and had to choose between those two venues for making money and both of them were viable, I would probably choose the sex. That doesn't necessarily mean that I wouldn't do it if it weren't for the money though. Like maybe I would rather play, I don't know, video games. But I go like, oh, I was going to play video games all day, but got to pay rent. Time to go fuck some lady, you know? Would that be a kind of violation of my consent? In a way, yeah, because my decisions are being imposed upon. They're being affected mm -hmm. by an economic requirement. But I don't think that's the same as a consent violation in, as if one were to do sex work and then was raped. So I, I, I never made that conflation. No, I though. know, but there is, there is, there is, because we keep saying consent, 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 consent. Like there, you know, there is a implicit blurring here. So I, so I just want to be clear. Rape happens a lot in sex work, and I'm not defending that. Obviously, forms of physical violation happen in a lot of jobs. Obviously, porn stars are very subject to it. You know because of the job that they do. Mm -hmm. But in a situation where that's not happening, and it's just a person who woke up that morning, and they had to make some money, and they chose to do sex work for it, and it was just like working a job. Not necessarily fun, but fine. Do you think that is worse than doing that same thing, getting up to work at like a, a, a Safeway, or like a grocery store, or whatever? Yes. And I, I think that's because the violation of sexual consent is uniquely worse than the violation of other types but of consent. But in this case, there is no to... violation of sexual consent. That's what I was talking about. So if you if you wanted to do it, and you went and you did it, and then you happen to make money off of it, but you were going to do it anyway? No, like a regular job, I wouldn't have done it anyway, but it was fine in doing it. Yeah, I still see an issue with it. But how is that different from the grocery store? Because, okay, because it contributes to a system of the subjugation of women. No, 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 we're just talking about, of... you know, we're just talking about two people filming porn together because they want to make some money and that's a way that they can make that money. Then two people outside of the industry, outside of the the broader industry of porn get together, film, and then capitalize upon it. And otherwise they wouldn't be doing it, but they do it because, you know, they enjoy doing it. I, I, still, I still see an issue with the coercive factor, but I think I, I, I will concede that it is the same issue is, is there with working at Kroger. Okay. Well, it's the same kind of issue. Well, that's what I but believe. Yeah, that the, there's with, nothing fundamental about sex work that is more coercive than all other forms of, of, of economic coercion. Well, I think that there are patriarchal social undertones to why somebody would pursue sex work and why somebody would uh, how somebody gets coerced into sex work that make it different. Well, a large, a, a, a significant portion of the people who do sex work are young women who do it to pay like college bills or whatever. And a lot of them like doing it because it pays a lot of money, sometimes, not for everyone, but for some people, a lot of money with relatively low effort. And also, you know, having sex is fun. Um, at least often, it can be. Um, I, 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 like, I, don't, I don't know how much I like the idea of accusing all of them or like feeding into the patriarchy, especially when I know there are, you know, homos who make their porn and they make it all gay-like, which isn't as patriarchal. You know, they gay it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I legitimately do believe that, like, the industry of porn is greatly influenced and a product of patriarchy, and it is an adaptation of patriarchy in a capitalist system. 
All right, but and, you know in a socialist society that there would be as much, if not more, porn, right? It just, people would just be doing it to do it. If you eradicated the market incentive for the production of pornography, I first of all, I doubt there'd be more porn. And secondly, whatever porn was made, I would defend and stand by because there would be no coercive factors of producing the porn. The por porn in itself is... It's not bad because it's the depiction of two people having sex. No, it's because the action of having sex was coerced out of them. And also that coercion is contextualized by the patriarchal system in which we live. And it is reinforced and created by the patriarchal system in which we live. Does what that if, make sense? What if there's a patriarchy under socialism, but they're not being financially motivated? Then sex work becomes a different conversation it wouldn't be just the monetary coercion of people it would be something else it would be like they are coerced into it by social factors well it could like, just be they like producing it but it contributes to a broader culture climate of, of of problematic behavior like maybe people are willingly engaging in the production of porn but it's still pretty popular for there to be like interracial porn where there's a giant black dude fucking a tiny white girl and she's like yelling the n-word or whatever. And that's like consensually produced in the sense that nobody needed to be paid for it because it's socialism, but it's still mirroring people's sexual desires and a lot of people have racist kinks. Then, okay, well, first of all, I, I forgot to mention, it kind of slipped my mind, that sex work would... It wouldn't necessarily even be work because there would it wouldn't be like coerced and with a money based system. So it would become something. The system would be fundamentally restructured. So the girls that are coerced through social factors rather than material, you know, money based factors, they would be coerced into it by you know people shaming them if they didn't do it, people pressuring them to do it in the first place, people doing all of these things to pressure them into it it would be a different beast than the current porn industry and it would receive different criticism if that makes sense i don't disagree with that i just realized that it's 10 30 though and i feel like i've um i feel like i've surpassed my expected allotment here uh, i i have no idea how long we've talked well I i've enjoyed the conversation no, a i have lot. to no and... i i have to for sure i appreciate you coming on I, I appreciate you having me on. Do you mind if I plug my socials? Or... Please go right ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. Wait, how are you plugging your socials? Are your socials in silent? I'm uh, signing into the Vosh pit. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, sorry. I, I, no, I, uh, I copy pasted something that I was not meaning to copy paste. Ignore that. Now you're messaging me from chat? Holy shit. I'm getting fucking boxed in from all angles here okay you had the yeah. uh you you committed the card so of, of disagreeing with me um so chat's been mean to you that's that's how it works i'm afraid <laughs> that's okay i i expected that yeah um solistocrat uh on on twitter and ranakuda on instagram i think i pronounced that right Thank you very much for coming on. Everyone appreciated your presence here. Um, even if they uh even if they, they don't immediately say it, they're just cranky. I I have been a long admirer of your content and it's been I, I mean, I was nervous to come on in the first place. I, I just I really appreciate it. Well that's Thank a you. that's a reaffirmation of the, the necessity to abolish all leaders, right? Because even me presiding over my stream chat imposes uh, a, a presumption of control that causes anxiety. Well, yes, I also simultaneously believe that you're a psychological operative imposed by the government, as Hassan is and as all uh, uh, prominent left-wing thinkers are. So, As you're right to. You take care, okay? You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. bye. Uh, Y'all were complaining for that one, but I had fun. Guys, just to know, I don't mean to be defeatist about anarchism. That's not my goal. Um, I think that a transformative change can happen. I've just... I've always been really respectful of the whole material conditions thing. The idea that, like, gigantic metamorphosis has to be... It has to coincide with changes to the world that allow for it. You know what I mean? Like, the, the great changes, looking back through history, didn't just happen. It was... The, the, it, society shifted to fill a mold. And 
you know, when, when that's, I, I'm, I'm very much a fan of that rhetoric, like buy your time, because I don't think today or tomorrow is the revolutionary day. And I don't know if it ever will be in my lifetime or whatever, but I do know that making the wrong call is what got Rosa Luxemburg killed, you know, and Rosa Luxemburg getting killed along with her compatriots definitely facilitated the rise of the Nazis because the communists overplayed their hand early isolated themselves from the social democrats and then doubled down on their whole social fascism is the same as fascism line which made them really bad advocates against the rise of the nazis specifically now would the nazis have risen to power anyway even without the failed german revolution maybe probably um but i do think things could have turned out better than they did